Hi, thank you so much for attending my webinar today. Today, we, I'm going to continue with the Visual Force to LWC series. I'm going to continue talking about how you can extrapolate coding concepts from Visual Force to learn Lightning Web Components. And if you don't know me, my name is Alba Rivas. I am a developer evangelist at Salesforce, and this is my Twitter handle in case that you want to contact me later, or if you want to ask me a question, please do it through this uh, Twitter handle, Alba SFBC. This series of webinars, I have created it to help you move from Visual Force to Lightning Web Components. It's targeted for Visual Force developers because there are some concepts that you can um, extrapolate to Lightning Web Components and that will help you learn that, that new technology. I uh, already gave the first webinar, which was called Architecture and Coding Concepts. And here you have the links to the English recording and the Spanish recording and doing the sessions in both languages. Um, today, we're going to continue talking about coding concepts. And in a couple of weeks, I'm going to give two more webinars. One is going to be about how to work with Salesforce data because, you know, Lightning Web Components is just the UI, so you have to retrieve that Salesforce data or modify that Salesforce data somehow, right? And there are better ways to do that uh, than Apex in some cases, so that's important to know. And I will give you another webinar, which is going to be about how to use Visual Force and Lightning Web Components together. If you want to reuse Visual Force, in some cases that's perfectly fine, and you can use Lightning Web Components and Visual Force together in the same page and communicate them. This is the forward-looking statement slide, which means that as, as, as Salesforce is a publicly traded company, you should make purchasing decisions based on the functionality that's currently on the market. And with that, I want to start by reviewing the contents of that first webinar. If you haven't watched it, what did we see in that webinar? Well, first of all, we explained all the web standards in which Lightning Web Components are based and how Lightning Web co learning Lightning Web Components will help you uh, learn standard things as JavaScript, as standard web components and um, web APIs, right? So if you then want to move to another JavaScript-based technology or another JavaScript framework, that's going to be super easy for you because you are going to have all the pillars from Lightning Web Components. Also, we saw how to configure your development environment, how to use Visual Studio Code to develop components locally, and how to use the Salesforce CLI to push and pull the changes from a scratch or, or even to use a sandbox or any kind of or. We also saw how to configure your or for debugging. And we saw some examples of how to use the Chrome developer tools to add breakpoints and debug your JavaScript code, which is super important in Lightning Web Components world, right? We also saw which are the differences in architecture from Visual Force to Lightning Web Components. Super important as well, because Lightning Web Components is a client-side uh, not, not language, but framework, right? That uses JavaScript as a language. Everything happens client side. Like the re rendering of components happens client side all the time. And we saw some examples of that. While Visual Force is a server side template in language, which is kind of different, right? Also, we saw how to create a Lightning Web component, the different files of which it is composed, and we started taking a look at some coding concepts. We saw the concept of properties, which uh, are very similar to Apex properties, right? It's something that you define that is going to hold the component state and that you can reference in your markup. But uh, in this case, they are defined in the client, in your JavaScript file, right? And we also saw how to 
declare properties using a getter and a setter to execute functionality or logic when the property is get or when the property is set. And here you have the links to the recording again, in case that you are lacking some of these uh, concepts. So today we are going to continue with those coding concepts. And the first thing I want to talk about is how you uh, conditionally render markup in line lingua components. So in Visual Force, you used the rendered attribute, right? You say, uh, I want this specific piece of markup to be rendered if a property in my controller is true or a property in my controller is false, or even you can use expressions to compute that, right? In lining with components, this is very similar. What we use uh, is a thing called template directives. Right? Template directives are not exclusive from Lightning Web Components. Other front-end frameworks as Angular have template directives as well. And in this case, what we do is to say, I want to show this template, this one here, if this property here is true. Right? We cannot use expressions. We use properties or properties defined by a getter and a setter optionally. And uh, remember that this is the way to reference properties that we define in the JavaScript file, but in the markup, right? In this case, uh, well, I'm just showing uh, a message saying these are the details, but this can contain uh, any HTML code that you that you need to show. And this case is very simple because I'm simply not showing the details because I'm setting this uh, property to false. But remember that the idea of properties is to um, contain the state of your component and your property is something that you can modify for within your JavaScript for, um, code in response to user interactions. So in a real example, maybe there is a button that you can click to change the value of this property. As a reminder, properties are observed by the framework. If the property is the is reference in markup and you change the value of that property, what's going to happen is that the Lightning Web Components engine is going to re-render the uh, component markup and um, paint it uh, with the new look, right? Okay, so let me go to VS Code because I have created all the examples here as well. This example is exactly the same one. I just have some more stuff to, to make it nicer. But basically, I have a template uh, that is only shown if details are visible. And in this case, I have uh, set the property to true. If I go to um, the org in which I have deployed all these components, this is the uh, example, okay? These two examples are from the previous webinar. And this example here, we can see that we are showing the details because our property is true. What happens if we change the property to false? Let's change that. And we are going to push the code. Remember that pushing the codes uh, only uh, sends the files that I have changed. Yeah, if you are using a scratcher, that is super helpful for developer productivity. And now I'm going to refresh the org and we are going to see how my um, details are not uh, visible anymore because the uh, condition was false, right? Amazing. So uh, you can use if true and you can use also if false. What else? Well, in Visual Force, if you want to do iterations, normally you use the apex repeat tab, right? So um, in Lightning Web Components, there are two template directives that you can use uh, to do that. One is for each and the other one is iterator. The difference between them is that iterator gives you 
access or gives you a property that you can uh, consult to see if the if a specific element is the first element on a list or the last element on a list. That's super helpful when you want to uh, apply a different behavior to the first and last element of a list. But in my case, uh, I wanted to keep it simple and I have used the for each uh, template. So how does it work? What we do is again, we define a template that is going to contain uh, the markup that we want to uh, repeat. And what we do is say, uh, is to say that for each item in this list, contacts is a list that I have defined in JavaScript. This is a JavaScript object because I'm generating that in memory. I'm not retrieving anything from the backend yet. We won't retrieve anything from the backend in this talk right in the next webinar we will do it but it can be uh, any arbitrary list it can be a list of uh, strings a list of integers whatever right in this case it's a list of javascript objects that i have created so what we do is we iterate over that list we define a, a variable name that will contain the uh, individual items on every iteration and then we can access the properties of each individual items within the iteration, right? In this case, the ID and the name, because that, those are fields that I'm defining here. Something, something that you have to bear in mind is that um, you have to use a key attribute for uh, performance reasons. This is because Lightning Web Components under the hood uses a virtual DOM and it is required that you use a key attribute on each individual row to univocally identify every element in the iteration. And don't worry if you forget that because uh, the compiler is going to complain. When you push the code, if you have forgotten to add the key attribute, the compiler is going to complain. Um, also, it's a good idea, for example, if you don't have a, a first level element that wraps all the content, create a, a div, for example, and assign uh, the key attribute to that div. I have seen people that create assigns that key attribute like to, to many first level elements, and that's not a best practice, okay? Just create a one first level element that wraps the rest of the HTML content, and that's it. Okay, so, uh, sorry, I'm going to show you this in, in my code, right, in Visual, Co in Visual Studio Code. This is uh, uh, exactly the same code that we saw before. I have the contacts property defined in JavaScript. And here we can see how we are iterating over the different contacts and showing the contact name. Okay, so um, following with uh, this uh, concept, which is the next concept that I want to talk about? Well, how to invoke JavaScript. In Visual Force, uh, you invoke JavaScript um, defining event handlers, right? So in Visual Force, for example, you can use a, a standard anchor link HTML element, and you can say that on click, I want to execute this JavaScript. And typically people use inline JavaScript in some cases. In other cases, people use functions that are defined in the uh, script portion of the IPS page. And in some cases, people execute functions that they import from a static resource, right? So here, what we do is to execute a method that has been defined in our class. As a reminder, a JavaScript class is something that is standard, again, okay, right? And JavaScript classes have, have methods. So what you have to do is to define a method and then you can bind the method saying on the name of the element, this is the standard click event that the anchor link element 
fires when when it is clicked, right? And uh, we define the binding that way. There is another way to to attach a handler dynamically, which is to query the DOM to to get that element, the a element, a element, sorry, and uh, then attaching a handler to it dynamically. But I wanted to keep it simple, and I picked the static way. So if you see here, I'm receiving the event as a parameter in this method. This is optional. I mean, if you need the event, you can uh, add the event keyword here and it will arrive to that uh, parameter as an argument. Uh, but if you don't need it, you don't have to write it. And then that event uh, is going to carry information in most of the cases, right? All the standard events and custom events inherit from a common event class that have um, certain param uh, properties that all, every event has, as for example, the target element that fire, fired the event. But some uh, events add additional properties. Well, for example, if you create a custom event, you can add custom properties, which is the information that the event is going to carry in the payload of the event. Okay, and you can access all that within here. So if we take a look at this example in our code, this is the example event handler, right? And I did something a bit more uh, complicated just to, to show you the dynamic nature of the, um, of the properties, right? So what, we, what I did was to create an anchor link, which on click is going to execute this method here. And this method, what it is doing is to change the value of a property. This property had an initial value of initial value. And now we are setting a new value, which is link one clicked. As we are referencing the property in the markup, right? The uh, Lining Web Components engine is going to re-render the whole component. So if we go here, we see that we are showing an initial value. This is the value that the property has at the beginning. And when I click here, the handler executed in response to the standard click event and the value of the property changed and the component was rerendered. Also, um, if, for example, you want to include uh, and execute functions that are part of a static resource, you can do that, but you do that in JavaScript. I'm not going, I'm not going to talk about that today, but you import uh, the resource here and you load the resource and then you can invoke functions within here. But the way to call JavaScript code is always binding an event handler. Okay, so next concept I wanna talk about is composition. In Visual Force, there are several tools that allow you to implement composition, right? You can create, for example, an Apex component and then reuse that Apex component within different Apex pages. And composition in Lightning Web Components is kind of similar, but uh, the communication mechanisms that the uh, different parent and child components have among them have been streamlined and follow the standard, right? Which is, um, it's how uh, web uh, applications have evolved during the last years. So let's say that we have a parent component, which is called composition and communication, right? And we have also a child component, which is called Alba Batu. I have created my own button, right? And we want to compose these two components. If you see here, normally the case of a component is camel case, right? It, start, it starts with lower case, and then on each word separation, we put a letter in upper case. If we want to compose components, first of all, we have to transform the uh, component name to be kebab case. 
what do we call this case kebab case? Because it looks like a kebab roll, like everything is in, in uh, lowercase and the word separation is done with dashes, right? And the second thing that we have to do is to add a namespace. The default namespace for custom components is C, is C for custom. This component is custom because it's something that I have created and I have deployed to my org. But if you download components from the app exchange for components, there is an app exchange for components if you don't know that, or if you install them uh, with a managed package uh, that a Salesforce partner has created, for example, those components typically are going to have a different namespace, probably the, the company name or the developer name or something like that, right? So what about the communication mechanisms that I told you are, are different, right? So there are two different flows in which you can communicate a parent component and a child component. The first flow is to communicate something from parent to child, right? And the second flow is to communicate something from child to parent. In this case, what do we want to communicate? Well, the button that I have created, I want it to be a reusable button. So I want to let the parent components that use the button tell me the label, what the label is, right? So we are going to, to, to pick the example of I want to pass the information to the child to set the button label. That is super easy to do. What we do is to define a public property on the child and then we can, as, as it is public, we can pass a value from the parent component to that property. Then uh, another example to pass information up. You have seen already how standard components pass information up because when we saw that event handler example with the anchor link standard HTML element, we responded to an event, the click event, that the standard component fired, right? The mechanism when you use a custom component is exactly the same. What you do is to fire a custom event from the uh, child component to the uh, parent component, or you can fire standard events as well. And you uh, define an event handler in the parent to listen to that event. If you come from Aura, this is different, right? Because in Aura, you have bidirectional data binding. You can pass information up via properties, and that is not possible anymore here. But why? Because we are following the standard, right? So let's see how all this is implemented. Great. So what about passing information down, right? First thing that we need to do is to define a public property. Label is a property, but then we mark it as public by using the API decorator. A decorator is something that adds functionality to the decorated entity. That can be a property, could be a getter as well. You can, you can uh, declare a public getter or public setter, right? Um, you can even decorate classes and functions. Decorators are not as classic from, from JavaScript. I have used a lot of decorators in Python, for example, and it's a design pattern as well, right? By uh, defining a property as public, you expect that the parent components that use this component set the value to that property. I mean, you cannot, you shouldn't, and you cannot modify a public property within the component, within the component in which it is declared. If you want to do that as a workaround, you can create an internal property and assign the value of the public property to that one when it is set, and then work with the internal property from within the component, okay? Then, I have declared a public property. How can we set a value to that property? Well, one of the ways is to do it 
using an attribute, right? When I declare my component, I pass a value to the label by declaring and by, by using an attribute. The other way is to do it dynamically, right? There is a way to query for this, query the DOM to, to obtain this element, the Alba button element, which is a custom element, right? And set the label. You, it's super simple because you use the dot notation. You, you, you do dot label equals whatever. Here, I'm using a fixed value, which is button one, but I could use um, a property that is defined in the parent, for example, and control the value of that label dynamically because we are passing information down and we can do that, right? And as label is a property, right, that we are defining in Alba button, we can use that property within our HTML on the child component. What about the other way around? I want to fire an event from the child to the parent. Okay, so you fire event by calling this dot dispatch event. Well, this is because this component is dispatching the event, but it's an element dot dispatch event, whatever element, right? And then you can create a custom event, for example, as I'm doing here. And uh, I have called this event Alba Click, and even you could add a, a property a, to um, set a payload to that event to carry some information. Let, let that event carry some information up to to any uh, listeners that are listening to it. Okay. In this case, what I did was to remember it was a. Um, uh, pink button, right? So what I did, I did was to to, uh, to create that pink, pink button, I used an anchor link, and then when, when that anchor link is clicked, I dispatch this custom event. Again, this is a super simple example. You wouldn't do this in real life, right? Uh, you would do that uh, with a more complicated use case, but uh, for, le for learning purposes, I think it's uh, valid, right? So, how do we subscribe to that event? How do we listen to that event? Well, same as we did in our standard element. We use on, then the name of the event, and then we uh, reference a handler that must be defined on the Apex class of or Apex JavaScript file of the parent component. There is a way to attach this handler dynamically as well as I explained before. In this case, what we are going to do? Well, we are going to change the value of that property that we defined and that now uh, lives in the parent component to see the example doing something, right? So I'm going to show you the example, which is this one, right? This is the parent component. I'm including Alba button. I'm setting a label and I'm responding to the click event. This is how I'm changing the property in the parent. And if we take a look at the implementation of Alba button, it's the same one that we saw in the slides. We are dispatching the custom event. So let's see this in action. This is our composition and communication component, the property that lives in the parent has an initial value. And we are going to click the button. And what happened was that the Alba click event went up. We listened to that event and we changed the value of my property accordingly. And uh, also notice that the label is something that we received from the parent. Okay. What else? In Visual Force, you have a library of standard components, right? So in Landing Web Components, you have also a library of base components. This library, you can find that, let me show it to you, going to, well, I always write LWC docs, then I arrive to the uh, Landing Web Components documentation site, and here you have the developer guide, 
and the play round that I showed you in the first webinar that allows you to, to see components in action here. But here you have the component reference, right? First, you have a section which shows the base lining of components, and then you have another section which shows the Aura base components. And if you open here, uh, the namespace, this is the lining namespace, is the one that base components use. Here you have uh, examples of how to use the component, which is super useful because you have different combinations of the uh, pa uh, com parameters of the component and you can take a look at them. You have a playground here that you can uh, edit um, in real time and see, see how the component looks like when you change something. And you also have the documentation and the specification. It's super useful. Okay, so, well, also I wanted to tell you because what happens in learning web components is that we have a security layer called local service that isolates uh, your component so that it is secure, so that uh, all the uh, components or agents that are in the page cannot modify the internals of the components unless um, it's something that you expose publicly, right? Which is what we did with the API decorator before. So sometimes happens that uh, the base components don't have a functionality implemented that you wanted to, and you cannot go and modify the internals of the components. So what we did to overcome that is that we open source uh, some of the base components. There are, I think, 50 of them open source. And uh, the URL is uh, base components recipes, github.com Salesforce base components recipes. And here in the LWC folder, you have all the base components that are open source. And also there is a folder which contains examples of how to use it. Okay, so uh, it's interesting to take a look at that. And let me, yeah, I need to present again. Let me reorder this. Okay, perfect. So, uh, these base components. Some people ask me, is there an equivalence of Visual Force standard components with lining with components, base components? And in some cases, there is, okay? The, obviously, the user experience is not the same one. It's a much better uh, user experience because a user experience has evolved a lot in the last 10, 15 years, right? But um, I have created this table so that you can uh, get an idea of which is the equivalence of components, but I don't want you to um, think about migrating a Visual Force page and do a one-to-one -one map mapping of components. As I told you, the user experience has evolved a lot in the last years. So if you have a Visual Force page that was written 10 years ago, it's better that you uh, reevaluate the overall user experience of the page and you decide what to do. Then if you need to use uh, this equivalence table, do it, but rethink your full page instead of doing a one-to-one -one mapping. This is the uh, second uh, part of the table. This table is attached on a PDF file on a trailhead module that I will show you later that we have just released. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about is how to perform navigation in uh, Lightning Web Components. In Visual Force, uh, you were used to use URL4 to compute URLs and then use a command button or command link or whatever standard HTML element to navigate to a page within Salesforce or even outside Salesforce, right? In Lightning Web Components, we have a service, which is the navigation service. The navigation service is super useful and you can do many things with it, but let's focus now on the uh, navigate functionality. 
but you do to navigate is import the navigation mixing. And mixing is another concept which is standard from JavaScript, right? And that allows you to um, execute methods that are defined in the mixing uh, without having to extend it. Is a kind of a abstract function uh, also in which some methods are implemented and some not. Uh, and this mixing contains some methods that you can invoke, for example, this one to navigate or to do other stuff, right? So what you do, you have to do is to extend the navigation mixing, passing in the lining element class. And then what we do is to call the navigate method, which is defined in the mixing, passing in a page reference. What, it's, what is a page reference? It's a representation of a page within Salesforce, a page that you want to navigate to. Where can I find these page references? Well, if you go to the documentation, there is a, a section which is called page reference types in which you have all the possibilities. You can navigate to an app page reference, to a lining component page reference, knowledge article, there are many options. And here you have the documentation that explains all the options. Okay, so, um let me reorder this and show you the example in this example what i'm doing is to navigate to uh, a standard objects page which is going to be the contact list view right and if i go to uh, the page we are going to see that if I click here on navigate, we are redirected to the contact list. Some things to highlight here are that I'm using a base component. I'm using the lining button base component here, thanks to the extensions I have installed for VS Code. I have direct access to the documentation. I know which um, which attributes I can use. And uh, as you can see, this lining button follows the Salesforce user experience and it's much, much nicer. Okay, is this one here, right? It's much, uh, much, more, much nicer than the pink button that I created. That is important as well, that when you create apps with Lightning Web Components, you try to follow the Salesforce user experience so that it is um, a, a good experience for your customers. Okay, what else can you do with the navigation service? There are many things that you can do. You can uh, default field values when navigating to a create page. This is kind of a replacement to the URL hacking technique that uh, you had uh, people used to, to do in Salesforce Classic, right? And it's very useful. I, this was recently uh, released. I think it was spring. Uh, also, you can generate URLs to navigate to page references. So instead of hard coding a URL, if you need a URL uh, for whatever, right? Um, that is not navigate because navigate you should use the navigate method. But if you want to obtain the URL, for example, for the contact list page, instead of hard coding that, you can uh, call one of the methods of the navigation service and get that URL. You can also read and modify URL parameters that can help you um, also maintain page state, for example, to determine if a specific component or section is open or is not open uh, in, um, in, base, uh, in base to the parameters that you have in the URL. And also you can preview and download files uh, that live in Salesforce. And it, this works very nicely uh, with Salesforce mobile, mobile app. Finally, I'm super happy to tell you that we have a couple of new resources available. Uh, 
And uh, the first one is a new sample app that we have created, which is the Visual Force to LWC sample app. I'm going to show you the app better. In this app, you are going to find patterns that are ever, that are very typical in uh, Visual Force and how to implement those patterns in Lightning Web Components. You can take a look at the Visual Force source and at the LWC source, right? We have everything implemented both in Visual Force and in Lightning Web Components. And what I have tried to do is to give solutions for things that were very uh, easy to do in Visual Force and that are not super straightforward in Lightning Web Components. For example, here, Creating a, a list with uh, record links uh, is not super straightforward uh, using base components, and um, I tell you how to do it here. Okay. Uh, also, uh, this app tries to use base components as much as possible. Additionally, we have released three new trailhead modules. The first one, well, this is a project, right? It's a quick start. It's called Explore the Visual Force to LWC Sample App. And it explains how to install and how to use this sample app. So I recommend you to take a look at this one and then install the sample app. The second one is Lightning Web Components and Salesforce data, data. This is generic, it's not a specific for Visual Force developer, uh, but uh, we realized that um, in Trailhead we didn't have too much information about how to um, work with Salesforce data, when to use Apex, when to use the Lightning Data Service, when to use the Lightning uh, Base Form components, and we created a module to uh, fill that uh, gap. And um, as I say, is for all kind of developers, but I think it's going to be especially interesting for Visual Force developers because Visual Force developers are used to work with Apex all the time, and uh, the paradigm changes a bit when, while working with Lightning Web Components. And finally, we have uh, Lightning Web Components for Visual Force developers, which is specifically created for you. All the webinars that I'm doing are um, based on that uh, Trailhead module. So if you have watched this webinar, it's a good idea that you uh, tackle that module because you are going to put in practice what you have learned. You are going to review all the concepts. And I think it's uh, super interesting. Uh, for me, uh, the order would be to start with this one and then uh, probably do this one and uh, at the same time or uh, after that uh, take a look at the quick start okay also if you want to take a look at the talk examples they are here right this is my github re one of my github repos and you can clone it and take a look and i wanted to add here some uh, links to other trailhead modules that have been there for some time, but I think that are important to, to know. The first ones are about how to use declarative features and low code tools to uh, replace Visual Force functionality. Sometimes that is the best way to go. We tend, developers tend to, to say, I, I just want to code, but sometimes it's much faster and uh, much easier to do like the repetitive thing that you don't enjoy coding with the creative functionality and then invest your, your time coding fun stuff. And also there is a trail, a whole trail about how to build Lightning Web Components. And also I have mentioned a lot of JavaScript uh, features that people are usually not familiar with. And there is a whole module about, uh, I think it's a trail about how to work with JavaScript using the most modern features. Okay, so we have arrived to the end of the presentation. That's all. Thank you so much for listening. And I uh, remind you, my Twitter handle, handle is AlbaSFDC. 
just in case you want to ask me any question, I will be super happy to help you. Thank you, and I hope you watch the next webinars. Bye-bye.